So that brings up the ethical issue, which is what I want us to focus on here, um, to see this as an ethical issue, right? to see climate change not just as a technical problem about how are we going to reduce greenhouse gases so that we prevent further disasters, but to see it as an ethical question. Because we have um, to decide how to allocate the greenhouse gases that can be omitted. And that makes it a, an ethical question, if you like, a question of justice. So there are possible principles that we could use for this allocation. What we're doing is we are effectively dividing up the atmosphere, okay? So we start with the idea that the atmosphere is a common resource. Nobody owns it. In that respect, it's like the oceans outside territorial waters. Nobody has a particular claim to it. Wouldn't make sense. You could try to say, well, why doesn't the US own the atmosphere in straight lines above its borders? But, you know, it moves around. You could, you could put greenhouse gases into the atmosphere above the US, but they wouldn't stay above the US. So that's not a feasible option. Secondly, it's not only a shared resource, it's a scarce resource. It's a scarce resource for the reasons that I've just given. Um, it seems extremely likely that if we continue to put greenhouse gases into it, then we'll get undesirable climate change, which we don't want. So it's as if we're all using one particular thing, whatever it might be, and uh, more people want to use it than can actually use it. You could think, if you like, of the atmosphere as a kind of a drain that we're pouring waste down. But if everybody pours all of the waste they want down, it'll get blocked and overflow. Nobody wants that. So we need to decide how much waste we can pour down. Instead of, in this case, instead of pouring it down, we're putting it up into the atmosphere. So we need principles of justice. So that really just sets out why this is an ethical question. And then the issue is, what principles of justice might we use in order to do this? So our previous president, George W. Bush, um, acknowledged in a way that, that this is an ethical question, because he talks here about um, being even-handed. And being even-handed, I think, is a synonym for being fair or being just in some way. But he refused to sign the Kyoto Protocol, which was the um, initial allocation of quotas for emitting greenhouse gases, because, he said, um, it would have uh, it exempted China and India from that treaty. Now, in fact, it didn't just exempt China and India. There was, it wasn't like there was a specific uh, exemption for those two nations. As I said a moment ago, the Rio statement, which the United States, um, under George W. Bush's father as president, um, signed, uh, that statement said that we're going to have these differentiated responsibilities for developing and developed countries. So the Kyoto Protocol is the first stage of implementing uh, restrictions on greenhouse gases, had uh, as an annex a list of countries that were developed countries, and then the other countries were, so they were referred to as Annex B countries, and then the other countries were the non-Annex B countries. And the countries that got quotas, or that were asked to take on quotas, were all developed countries. And all of the developing countries were not included. So, in fact, it's not just China and India, though they are the two biggest countries that were not included, of course, um, but a whole host of developing countries that were not included. But what President uh, George W. Bush was suggesting there, I guess, is that that's not really fair, that that wasn't fair, and that that was why the United States should not and did not sign the Kyoto Treaty, and uh, the United States won't sign the Kyoto Treaty as it's really um, expiring anyway. It's reached its period and it's coming, come up for 
coming up for replacement and negotiations going on on what should replace it. Um, most of the other developed countries uh, did actually sign on to it. Uh, the other exception, this is slightly embarrassing for me, is Australia. So both the country of my, uh, my origins and the country I'm, um, I'm in now are the, the two exceptions, the two developing nations that refuse to sign it. Um, and both are, as we'll see, very, well, both are very significant uh, greenhouse gas emitters on a per capita basis. Um, but the other nations generally did sign it, although how well they then complied with it is um, another question. And that's a bit debated because how you actually calculate emissions is um, not something that everybody agrees on. But in any case, the, the issue I want to look at is um, whether, in fact, we could say that the exemption of the developing countries is made it unfair, made the, the idea that the developed countries should restrict their greenhouse gases unfair. Uh, uh, <coughs> so um, here's one principle that uh, we can talk about. Actually, there's several principles on this list, but I just took it off the web because I thought it was nice that this was a, a principle that kindergarten uh, kids can um, endorse, or oh, elementary school, sorry, not kindergarten. I shouldn't exaggerate. Um, but the one I'm, I'm interested in here is number two. You break it, you fix it, um, which is a principle I'm sure you've all been told about at some point or other. Um, so this is, how does this principle apply to climate change? Uh, the idea here is that if you've damaged something, you're responsible for restoring it to its previous condition. So we can see the atmosphere as damaged because it no longer has the capacity to absorb our greenhouse gases without contributing to further climate change. And um, therefore, you can ask, well, why is this the case? Um, who brought about that damage? And the answer is that this has largely occurred as a result of industrialization. And since, so it's the countries that industrialized early, the uh, nations of uh, Europe, particularly Northern Europe, um, and the United States that um, have put most of the greenhouse gases into the atmosphere and are therefore responsible for most of the problem. Now, as I said, there's some arguments about how you calculate greenhouse gas emissions. And if you take into account land use and the clearance of forests, you do get a somewhat different picture because uh, some countries have cleared their forests a long, long time ago. <coughs> Other countries have cleared them more recently. And if you're looking at what's happened more recently, then um, you would take into account of forest clearances more recently. So in particular, for example, South America um, would be responsible for more greenhouse gas emissions if you count forest clearance than if you only count the use of uh, things like fossil fuels or uh, other gas emissions. So um, even so, though, you find the industrialized nations are heavier on this. Here's a, a graph that looks at this historical responsibility for it. And it's looking at, on the black bars, responsibility for the uh, greenhouse gas emissions or contributions to climate change that have already occurred with a two th by 2000. Um, the hatched ones are the ones that are likely to have occurred on present predictions by 2050, and the gray takes it to the end of the century. Um, so you can see that the United States does rank very high here. Um, South America is uh, significant because of the land clearance, as I mentioned. Um, OECD, uh, nations of Europe, the industrialized nations of Europe, um, rank uh, pretty high as well. FSU stands for the former Soviet Union. Those nations are lumped together, the, uh, the nations that used to make up the Soviet Union, um, which is significant but lower. Um, South Asia, uh, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, uh, Sri Lanka, and so on, are uh, fairly low. And uh, East Asia is um, somewhere in the middle of those. Um, and South Africa is the only African nation included here, but it's actually the most uh, industrialized, low, um, uh, so, so the rest of Africa would rank uh, very low as well. 
So on this scale, on this scale, if you're going to use this you broke it, you fix it principle, it looks like um, you couldn't say that it would be unfair for the United States to reduce its greenhouse gas gases when uh, India, included in the South Asia block, and China, included in this East Asia block, are not because uh, the United States' contribution to historical responsibility is significantly more than that of either India or China. So let's look at some objections to this idea. One possible objection is that if we use the principle of historical responsibility, it means that those people who in fact are not in any sense morally at fault are going to have to pay for what their ancestors did, or they're going to have to reduce their emissions because of that. Um, so, for example, anybody, including uh, any of you, I guess, were, were, were born after most of those emissions that the United States is responsible for um, has caused, why should you be responsible? Or what if you're a recent immigrant from another country, maybe one of the countries like Africa with very low emissions, um, why should you have to contribute to reduced emissions because of things that you're not responsible for? So here's a possible response, just as if you, know, you countries regard themselves as responsible for debts incurred by previous governments, even if um, that happened before you were born or before you emigrated uh, to the country. Um, you're still responsible for that. So you could see what we have done to the atmosphere, what this nation has done to the atmosphere, as uh, something like a debt that's been incurred that you take on because of uh, what's happened, perhaps also because of benefits that you obtain from it. Because by industrializing, we were able to establish a more prosperous society um, and to live at a higher standard, which continues. And so in some sense, you could say, we're also benefiting from those previous emissions. OK. A second objection to this claim is that for most of this period of industrialization, people didn't know about climate change. So how could they be responsible for something that um, they were ignorant of, and not only ignorant of in the sense that they didn't bother to find out, but the information really was just not there. And that is true, although in fact the suggestion that the release of greenhouse gases, or carbon dioxide in particular, was going to warm the planet does go back to a Swedish scientist, Svante Arrhenius, in the 19th century. Um, so the hypothesis was out there, um, but you couldn't say that it was well established until uh, perhaps the 1970s, 1980s, when um, more research began to be done on this, and it started to look uh, at least quite likely, um, even if the degree of confidence that the majority of scientists have been expressing has gone up. And by the way, Arrhenius, being a Swede, although he noticed that uh, release of increase in carbon dioxide could warm the planet, didn't think that that was going to be a bad thing at all. So it does depend a bit on your perspective. So um, is it right, though, to hold people responsible for um, things that they could not reasonably foresee? Um, often it would not be right, but um, what you could do is say, um, go back to 1992, go back to that Rio summit where by that time, people did know or at least believe that it was, would be quite dangerous to continue to release greenhouse gases. And so you could say, all right, let's wipe the slate clean until 1992. Let's not hold anybody responsible for the greenhouse gases they emitted until that time. But um, we are responsible for them. And in fact, the chart doesn't look dramatically different. It does look somewhat different, but um, certainly the major industrialized nations have continued to emit uh, more greenhouse gases than the others, with the 
uh, exception of the recent growth of emissions from China, which um, has certainly become much more significant because of its recent industrialization.